right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by Kevin Popovich, who's also in lovely San Diego. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm awesome, John. How are you today, my friend? Fantastic. And Kevin is the idea, the idea guy, a problem solver that helps people, teams, and leaders create new ideas. All right, uh, Kevin, so we, we've, we've gone through and are still going through from very strange circumstances with the pandemic and unrest and all of these other things that are going on right now. So how do, how do you advise people how to not just survive a period like this, but thrive, become creative and find ways to actually make this into a positive experience in the long run? Well, I think the biggest challenge that I see, John, uh, are people being able to respond to the proper problem. Um, mm -hmm. I think pre-pandemic, everybody had a, a, a set of stories uh, or lore, things that have happened in their com company before that they had experience with and perhaps some protocol uh, and some proven uh, solutions on how they might best address that. Uh, today, uh, the stories are very different. You know, we're, we're hearing about um, hundreds of thousands of people uh, being impacted. Uh, we have people that are displaced. You have businesses that, quite honestly, should be questioning, are they still in the same business as they used to be? And uh, I think that's the biggest challenge that I see is trying to make sure that you're responding to the right problem. Yeah, and I think that's a fascinating point because you're correct, because we tend to use the past as prologue. And we tend to look back at our experiences and try to react to things like maybe things that worked in the past, or as you say, maybe there are uh, problems or obstacles in the past and we handle them in a certain way rather than saying, okay, this is a whole new experience and I don't really have, I don't really have anything to draw on per se. So I have to face this as a brand new challenge. And so working on the right problem is the is the biggest challenge that I think businesses have because they tend to have uh, resources. They tend to have people who are trying to do the right thing. Uh, all of them are motivated to make a positive change. It's in their best interest, let alone uh, that of their organization. Um, so much like the uh, Indiana Jones movie, uh, you know, uh, where uh, uh, Indy realizes uh, they're digging in the wrong place. Uh, that's right. often what I see with businesses today, John. I see people working really hard, trying to make change, uh, but they're digging in the wrong place. Therefore, they will never find the treasure they seek. So how do you advise people to actually really analyze what the right problem is? Because you're very, you're correct. And, and people uh, have, have great enthusiasm and energy for solving problems, but they start to solve the problem, as you say, before they know what the problem is. People love to get active, love to do stuff. So yeah. what are some of the steps to identifying what the real problem is? Well, uh, the first thing that we do is to uh, create a problem statement. And that problem statement uses words to make sure that everybody involved in problem solving is really heading in the right direction, right? And the problem statement is uh, based on a couple uh, key components. And I, and I have a, a tool, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to help um, uh, create those problem statements. And this is what I refer to as my problem statement mug. And, and there is a left-handed uh, left and a right-handed, and there's a reason why. Right. So uh, early in the morning when you're trying to solve problems, right, you know, you, you walk into your, your office or any office and you haven't had your coffee yet. And you got somebody coming, John, John, we got to think we have this. And you're like, OK, so if it's a, are you right handed or left handed, John? I'm right handed. OK, much like myself. So in my right hand, what you what you, we see in the morning is a reminder to ask people, what's your problem? Right. <laughs> And then on the other side is the cue for them to help us because we haven't had our coffee yet to remember to answer how might we, because it always starts with potential, right? How might we help who, who are the people that we're talking about, mm -hmm. do what? What are we trying to get them to do and achieve what goals? What are the KPIs or the metrics that we're going to use to understand we're making a difference, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if we can put together something like this within an organization, uh, then this becomes a new way for us to communicate. And it's great. Everybody wants to be uh, told about what you see. I want to hear your perspective. But help me out and put it in a way 
that I can do something about it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the how might we really speaks to potential. How might we make change? Uh, because I find all too often in organizations, John, there's somebody who says, I have an idea, you know, <laughs> uh, and they go with their first idea, which statistically your first idea is not your best idea. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, if we look at the potential and we look at all ideas from all perspectives of the people that are involved in the problem, then we get a better understanding of what the problem really is. And we're talking about then who's involved in that problem. And what needs to change from the way it is today, right? And then ultimately, uh, there has to be some sort of uh, KPIs, right? Um, yeah. uh, are we looking at it, it's a number, it's a percentage, it's a time frame, something that allows us to have a North Star, right, for the team right. and the work. Because even a, even a couple degrees off over time uh, ends you up in a different destination. Yeah, and it's and it's fascinating what you say there because you're correct. I mean, oftentimes uh, you say, "Okay, we're having a brainstorming session," and somebody comes up with an idea, and then everybody immediately goes to, "How do we implement that idea?" And they start to come up with things rather than saying, "Okay, hang on a second, can we make that idea better? Is it even a good idea?" And uh, uh, and and it is people's natural inclination to get to problem solving before the you know the problem has been identified, as you said, or to get to idea implementation before the idea has been properly explored. And that's something that you have to kind of stop people from from you have to ha sort of help people not do that. Right. Right. And it's tough because people get all excited. They're like, yay, a solution. We yeah. pointed one. Oh, thank goodness you saved us again. You know, uh, and um, and I think people can do better than that. You know, one mm -hmm. of the things that I learned in my work with design thinking is the key role of empathy and define. And for those listeners who aren't really familiar with design thinking, design thinking is a process for creativity. For those of you who do know about it, I'm going to oversimplify this too much where it might make you irk a little bit, but for time's sake, um, there's mm -hmm. six basic steps to this, right? Uh, starting with that problem statement, once we know the problem we want to solve, then we begin design thinking and we start with empathy, developing an emotional understanding of the people involved in the problem. And that's all of the perspectives uh, mm -hmm. involved. <clears throat> and then through that learning, we gain a greater understanding and there's different stages, right? You start with research. What do we know already? And then you go into observation. What can we see about what they told us already? And then you go to engage it. Now I'm going to go down and talk to the people that, I, that are in this thing. And then you might even move it into ethnography where we become them and we start walking that walk. And at each level, we gain a greater understanding. So then we move into step two, which is to find we can now reframe that problem statement from the different perspectives. And ultimately, there's 99 out of 100 times, John, there's always a change to your problem statement because you have learned more now. You have become part of that problem. So you see things that, uh, as my dear friend Eric uh, Kaufman has said, uh, were in your blind spot that by definition are invisible to you. You will mm. never see them. Uh, so then with that adjusted problem statement, then we can confidently move forward to how might we solve this? We start with divergent thinking because we want a bunch of ideas from all the perspectives. Yeah. And personally, I go for the big, crazy, oh my God, it could never be that way idea because <laughs> it's easier to bring a big idea down than make a little idea important. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, we take that idea, we prototype that, we test that prototype. And then lastly, we share uh, that new idea. Uh, with the universe to see what we can learn. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a that's a fantastic process. I think, and it is. I think I see a lot of people jump, you know, skip all those bits in between. And I think there's a natural inclination, maybe now, is because people feel a sense of urgency that they have to come up with the the next idea now, and they have to implement it now, rather than go through that go through the phases that you're talking about. But those shortcuts never never end up being shortcuts, right? Yeah, well, you just end up coming back and doing it right, the, you know, the second yeah. time. Yeah. You know, because people want to jump right into prototyping, which you'll have some people in my business that says, well, uh, we're thinking while building. Great. Mm -hmm. We're thinking while building. I, I, I agree that um, when we start to assemble things, new things come into our mind. But if we do our due diligence and follow our protocol, that those who have come before us have proven it works better this mm -hmm. way. Let's just roll with it and then get to that super excited part where I want to build it. Great. It'll be better built that time. 
So yeah, uh, yeah. I applaud the enthusiasm and I applaud the people who believe in their ideas. I just think that it can be uh, more purposeful and more productive uh, if we do it uh, in concerts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think now is a fantastic time because, I mean, maybe one of the starting points you need to look at is, is your business right now? And uh, is your target audience still the same target audience that you had pre-pandemic? Have their needs changed? Is there, do you need to pivot a little? Do you need to look at adjacent markets? Do you need to look at markets maybe that you were never in before that maybe you need to adjust to? So there's, there's so much more thinking, I think, that needs to go into the process right now. I agree with you, John. And I've been coaching my clients to go through a business model canvas. Uh, there's a lovely book um, that uh, I can't remember all of the authors, uh, but the business model canvas is a one sheet, eight and a half by 11. And we used it quite a bit at San Diego State when I was the director of the Idea Lab and part of the Entrepreneurship Center to help communicate uh, how a business operates on a single sheet of paper. And mm -hmm. uh, we say, if you can't figure this out, right, then you've got bigger problems than, oh, oh what should I do about this? Because it talks about uh, the, uh, your, your customer segments, your value prop propositions, uh, and what you have to do in order to make that happen. Uh, and I have seen every business make some kind of change. Uh, so I caution those listeners that says, well, my business is different. Mm -hmm. No, it ain't. <laughs> yeah, everybody's business is different, but to I be know, honest, right? is, every, yeah, everybody's yeah. special, and, I, and you have to know me, and my customers love me, and I have no competition, and all this other happy horse shit that after being 30 years in business, I can tell you, it's just not like that. Yeah, and I can give you a great example. Way back, I, I was running a company um, many years ago, and we had our proprietary implementation model, right? And then we um, we we were, became partners with another company, and some of our competition also became partners. And we had this meeting, and we said, "Okay, we all trust each other now. We will all share our implementation models, our proprietary implementation models." And what do you think? What do you think? Uh, happened after like three or four people shared theirs. Yeah, I don't need to do this. They were all pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and therefore, I think sometimes we, yeah. we like to overestimate our, our uniqueness and realize that there's a lot, you know, that there a lot of the macro issues out there are the same for everybody. Yeah, you remind me, it's uh, it's like the scene in Fast Times at Ridgemont High where they disclose what their secret sauce is. You know, one's yeah. ranch and the other one is like mayonnaise or something <laughs> like that, you know? Yeah, ex exactly. And that's why I think you're you're 100% correct is that I think everybody should be examining their business right now. Everybody should be questioning it. Everybody should be saying, okay, are there things that I need to do differently? And going through what you just described as an, as an ideas framework. Yeah, I think it's a uh, it's the perfect time to do it because most businesses uh, have uh, their workforces deployed and they're trying to get some sort of productivity. Hey, I'm paying these people because of my PPP loan, you know, and uh, and and, and uh, uh, but you know, having them getting them a laptop and setting up a Zoom account does not engagement make right. Let's yeah. do something productive in this time where we're able to uh, focus everybody's attention in a purposeful way. Uh, I, uh, I keep you know, telling my clients that you know, uh, the universe has shaken up this snow globe that we call Earth, right? Uh, and everything is like this, but it doesn't have to settle in the same place that it was. So I see opportunity in this uh, chaos, John, uh, for those who are prepared to innovate. Yeah, and I think, and it, and you touched on the fact, you know, people may be virtual for the first time or whatever, but this is, a, I mean, and we've done that strategically for about six or seven years, run a largely virtual company um, for strategic reasons. But this is a fantastic time for organizations to relook at everything and say, hey, maybe this is better for my company. Maybe this makes for happier, more productive employees. Maybe this allows people to live where they want. Maybe we can operate on, who says we have to operate within these particular hours? Maybe we can operate you know, a little bit differently. There's so many opportunities now. I think it'd be such a shame if people just kind of batten down the hatches and tried to survive so that everything goes back to the way it was. Because it's not, as you said, this, the snowflakes are not settling in the same way. They're not. And if they do, shame on you for, for the missed opportunities. I agree with your assessment, John. I think it's, it is a golden opportunity. And if we look back at, at other tumultuous times, 
You know, you mm-hmm. look at the number of millionaires uh, and billionaires that came out of the Depression era. You look at the innovation and the products that came out of post-World War II and other times that were troubling for different countries. Uh, mm-hmm. There is an opportunity here. If you don't come out of this with some gold in your pocket, then you missed yours. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And that's why I think, uh, uh, to your point again, is that I think this is a fantastic time to, rather than just put your head down and try to survive, is is get creative, get get the ideas flowing. Uh, and I think that also ener- will energize anybody who works with you, anybody in your company, where they look at you and say, oh, wow. So they're taking time now to actually generate ideas for the future rather than panicking, and just panicking about the present. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I've always said that uh, people follow as long as they believe they are being led. It's mm-hmm. when they don't see leadership, that they start worrying and figuring out things for themselves. So it is a chance for leadership to show why they're leadership. It's a chance to reshape culture. It's a, it's, a, it's a chance to regain market share because those in your space that are cowering back, that are waiting to see what happens, are losing ground. Yeah, because it's never very conf- it's never very confidence building is when you see your leader disappearing into their bunker. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> and it tells me that I should start writing my goodbyes, right? yeah. or, I should, or I should look for a different job, <laughs> or I should go start that in, that 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 spinoff that I've always thought my mm-hmm. company should do, but they're not going to apparently. Um, you're going to lose good people if you don't uh, if you don't corral them, give them that pep talk, right? You know, the second half is uh, is still to be determined. Mm-hmm. Uh, out of all this and uh you you're either gonna write your history uh or somebody's gonna write it for you yeah exactly and as i always say i mean why outsource your your destiny to faith you should really like try and play as big a role in it as you can amen amen yeah. i'm sure there's like a great irish proverb about that john oh there's plenty of irish proverbs but most of them don't you know most of them take too much explanation you know <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, uh, listen, Kevin, this has been fantastic. All of Kevin's information will be in his contributor bio uh, below. But before we go, Kevin, please do um, share a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, so I'm the idea guy, John, and uh, I help people create new ideas for the new normal. Um, uh, obviously, that's been updated <clears throat> for this troubling time that we're in. Um, but I think it really is uh, a call to action for those companies who are looking to make change. So the ways that I help people is uh, I speak with people. I don't speak at people. Uh, And my job is to share information that I have, uh, stories of my past experience uh, to help broaden an understanding around creativity and innovation. Uh, I deliver workshops that let people experience the things that I speak to and I help train them in order to do the things uh, that I'm able to do uh, for those clients um, who are looking to extend their team. I serve as an adjunct Think of me as the uh, adjunct idea guy because uh, most people don't, most organizations don't need a full time idea guy, uh, and most organizations don't have a department that is dedicated to helping people generate new ideas that solve their business problems. That's how I am. Yeah, fantastic. And I do have a proverb for you there. There you go, Kevin. May the most you wish for be the least you get. How about that? (laughs) (laughs) That That's grand, brother. Just grand. All right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.